Uh, my name is Peter Jones. I'm a principal engineer at Cisco. I'm on the development side. From this point of view, I'm also the, currently the chair of the NBASD Alliance. So if you guys have been watching the news recently, you'll find there's a whole lot of interest about uh, providing two and a half and five gig rates on Ethernet. There's a couple of alliances. There's some standards work. I'm really going to try and talk about all of that. Um, let's see. So I'm going to talk a few things. I have an introduction and session plan. I have some use cases and product. I will warn you ahead of time. This is a uh, product management slide. I have a basic deck. I try to pull bits of it out, but the format's changed, and so I'm just going to sh sh shift sideways to their deck. We'll talk a little bit about what Embase is doing. I'll show you some, some system architecture, and then we'll sort of talk about some other stuff. Okay, about me. Uh, history at Cisco. Um, I worked on the Catalyst 3850 development. So that was the thing we launched uh, in January 13. So that's the 3850, the 3650, WLC 5760. I'm really on the system architecture side, both software architecture, hardware architecture, um, ASICs. So I'm wandering around Cisco Live with uh, an ASIC here. So this is the ASIC that's powering the 3850, 3650, 5760. Um, so I worked pretty much from definition development and also all the evolution of that chip. Um, what else do I say about myself? Um, I'm sort of in system architecture for converged access. That was a whole big wide wireless convergence. Um, I think we heard a few other people saying, we're getting to the stage where we need to basically treat this all as access. So ultimately, you don't really care whether someone's coming in wide or wireless. You want the policy to apply to them no matter who they are. So I think ultimately the goal for that is you want the same policy for you no matter who you are, but it might be based on where you are and what device. Um, Standards-wise, I'm working in 802.1 TSN. For you guys who followed, this is like the evolution of AVB. This is trying to put a whole lot of new services into Ethernet. That was where I was at standards. Um, but then, and that also involves um, .3BR. So we're currently working on preemption in Ethernet. And that again is to do with new types of service across Ethernet where we're looking at uh, really deterministic services. Um, I got pulled out of that one when um, in September there was a, a request to start a standard for two and a half and five gig Ethernet. So that's really where um, this thing called NGABT, or Next Gen Enterprise Access Based T. And this is really trying to give you two and a half and five gig Ethernet um, on your current cables. So the whole pitch here is I'm going to give you more speed on Cat5 or Cat6. Um, that then basically spun into uh, forming and launching the NBASD Alliance. Uh, if you follow the media, you know there's two alliances here. There's one uh, centered around Cisco and Aquantia and a few others, and another centered around Broadcom. So I'm on NBASD. Uh, the Broadcom Alliance is called MGBASD. And I'm the Alliance Chair. Uh, my contact info is over here, email. Um, I tweet somewhat, and LinkedIn. So Lauren has these slides. I'll assume she'll send them to you later on. Session plan, I was thinking five minutes introduction, some product management stuff for 20 minutes-ish, some technical stuff for 20 minutes. That gives us some time. This is all very flexible. If what I'm saying is not interesting, we'll move on. If it's interesting, just stop me. Um, from my point of view, if when I finish you have a lot more questions, that's good because you'll ring up later on. Um, on the way through, feedback is good. Uh, if it's not clear, tell me. If it's interesting, tell me. Um, it's all about you. Thanks for having me here. So this is basically a deck that I pulled from my product management colleague. And the reason it's here is because otherwise I was going to have to go and read all these slides about the use case. Um, so we're going to talk about industry trends with 11AC and beyond. I heard 11AC from a couple other people. I think everyone's got the idea. Um, we'll talk about multi-gigabit technology. I'm sorry for the, the very long name. We had a much shorter one we liked, but branding said we couldn't use it. And I'll quickly cover the products that we have. We announced products last week. They're actually on the World of Solutions show, show floor, so you want to go and have a look. Okay, 11AC drivers. For this crowd, you guys all know 11AC, right? I'm not going to read through this slide. Um, I think the real thing we've been seeing now is if you go and look, um, wireless is really transforming. Um, you know, it was originally a nice to have. And we're seeing it really become mission critical for a bunch of places. Where people think that the wireless is more important than the wired, which is sort of interesting since it's mostly got wired behind it. Um, and also we've seen the speeds go up, right? The wireless guys have done a great job. It was interesting when I was speaking to Ethernet. It's like your Ethernet guys are really good, but the wireless guys are doing better. So you can see that they've done a great job over the last few years. And we have this nice interesting crossover point about here with 11AC Wave 1. I mean, this is the, I think, uh, it was a Meraki person talking about gigabit, gigabit Wi-Fi is a really interesting story. Two or four gigabit Wi-Fi is interesting again. So the, the, the bottleneck we understand, and this is something we saw a couple of years ago. Okay, we can see what's happening with Wave 2. So I can, I can go and build a Wave 2 AP. That'll be nice. What will I plug it into? So as we all know, um, I have some stats later on. An awful lot of cable in the world is 5E or 6. 
10G base T almost has no deployment on the campus. Unless you have 6A, you can't run 10G base T over 100 meters. So we understand the problem. Uh, you go above one gig, you now have a bottleneck. How am I going to solve the bottleneck? Some people do it with multiple cables. We have to pull new cables, you have to pay for two switch ports. And depending on how you do your, your wireless, load balancing can be interesting. As you know, Cisco, right, we, we like centralizing things, so put everything through a tunnel. Load balancing one tunnel through two ports is not as easy as it sounds. Um, so the answer is we're going to go and do something. We're going to go and build two and a half and five gig. Um, so I'll get into some alliance details later on, but right now the alliance is called the N-Base-T. Right? The other one, which you can go and find out about, is called MG-Base-T. You know, the names are very similar. But basically the goal is we want to give you two and a half and five gig on your current installed base cable. Uh, also, we want to give you all the POE standards up to 60 watts. So the goal is basically to take you from your architecture where you had uh, one gig running to your APs with all the power, basically swap each end and then run two and a half or five. Which speed you want, I think, depends on exact on long term on the, how, how much you spent on the switch and how big your AP was. I think they both survive long term. So the goal is five, up to five times the speed, no change the cabling. Okay, everyone's still nodding. There's no questions. Okay. All right, why not 10G base T? Um, you guys probably don't know this. Uh, it doesn't run over Cat 5E. Uh, Cat 6, it's only 55 meters. Um, there's a lot of question about how, you know, how long the cable in the wall really is. But unless you do a very expensive site survey, you can't find out. So you can go and ask people. It's like, how long do you think it is? And they say, it's about this long. So I think of this as being a bit like when Sonnet existed and needed protection in 50 milliseconds. Most people don't know it was actually 65. You had 15 to detect and 50 to react. But 50 milliseconds became, it was, it was the number. So if you said you're better than 50, no one complained. I think in base T cabling, you say 100 meters. You know, if you said 75 meters, then it's like, I'm not sure if it's okay. So this number's here. Um, one of the things we do as part of the Ethernet standard that is starting up right now is we went and got some cabling data done. There's a research firm called uh, Bisria. They are probably the best in terms of their actual knowledge of what's shipping. So they went and did some numbers. They have some basic data. They manipulated it. Um, when you get the, the link later on, this is basically stuff extracted from something I gave to IEEE that actually links back to the more of the Bisria data. So the basic point I'm going to pull up to you, and I'm sure it's a slide chart, is this is, this is uh, 5E. This is 6. What you find is 6A is very small. These numbers actually combine data center enterprise, and I'm going to guess almost all of 6A is in um, data center. So the guess for basically installed outlets, and this is really a drop from, from a wiring closet switch to an edge, is they're guessing, uh, sorry, they're analyzing at their best research. 53% of Cat 6 and 38 of Cat 5E. What's interesting is between when we started the process and we came back, these numbers changed radically because the style, the style of survey changed. So these guys, basically what they're doing is they're looking at the cable shipped in every region. They have assumptions based on a lot of research about how much of that is replacement and average drop size. And so what they do is they basically run the numbers through and this is the best guess of what's actually out there in the wall today. It varies wildly between regions. Uh, Europe is much higher in Cat 6A, Asia not so. But the net, the net point here is that we have a huge install base. Um, it works out to be something like 1.3, between 5E and 6, it's about 1.3 billion, trillion ports. So, trillion, billion. So the basic point is there's an awful lot of market, right? If you had to wait for 6A to take over, you'll be waiting around a 15 year life cycle. Clear? Yes? No? Okay. Uh, second cable, okay, so I was asking again when I was in Atlanta, not last week, the week before, how much does it cost to pull in your cable? And the answer is it's like a piece of string. Um, it depends whether you're unionized or not. It depends whether you're in a heritage building. So the answer is no one really knows, but everyone knows it's expensive. I heard numbers between $300 and $500, maybe $800 a drop. I think the key point here is if you have to pull a new cable, then adoption of the new APs just takes a lot longer. Question? No, I was just saying that's cheap cable pull. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I agree. I think the problem is there's no good number. So you say a number which is big enough so people say that it matters, but small enough so they don't argue with you. Yeah, yeah. so that it's believable. Yes, uh, the, the goal isn't to be right. The goal is to say you got it, right? So if you imagine that a gig port is costing you somewhere between 50 to $70 and you say to use another port, I need another $300 for the cabling, 
and I have to get a wreck, and I have to maybe go through the wall, and if it's a hospital, clearly pulling new cable is something you don't want to do. Now, I think it's true to say that we would still recommend, if you're doing a full refurb, if you're gutting the building, go, go, pull, go pull the best cable you can. But there's an awful lot of people who want to basically incrementally update. And so we're really saying there's a lot of that market that we need to address. Um, so someone did a case study, so it's 1,000 access points. As you said, this number, it could be a lot lower, it could be also a lot higher. I think the key point is it's a lot harder to plan your upgrade when you have to go and pull a lot of new cable. Someone says, well, why don't you just pull new cable for the APs? And you go, that's also a nightmare. So we're trying to avoid that. Okay, so I'm going to skip through these. So the key points is we want to basically, we want to basically run the same uh, higher speeds over the same other topologies. So one, one cable for data, one the same cable for power. So ultimately it's about, you could imagine that for your next upgrade, I'm going to go and see new switches. Maybe nine months later, you pull some new APs, you pop them out, it just goes faster. Um, PUE, PUE Plus, and the Cisco is the UPUE. There's actually work in this in dot three standard right now. The next power might end up being up to 90 or 100 watts. There's a whole lot of people chasing uh, power, powered lighting. So the IEEE is sort of notorious, at least in the wireless space, for um, once something is, is sort of pre-standardized, once it once it rolls into a standard, they intentionally break it to, to sort of level set the playing field from everybody moving forward. Hold that question because I'll because because I'm going to get to that a little bit later. I'm, at the minute, I'm I'm trying to separate. But this is my product management hat on, right? And a little bit later, I'll try and put my standard strategy strategy hat on. But yes, you you raise an excellent question. Um, so we have an explicit goal, and we'll work as hard as possible to form up an alliance and make our thing standards compatible. Now, do we succeed? That's a good question. You need a crystal ball. OK, so we have products. Um, these are the products that were announced last week. We have a new compact switch with a couple of um, multi gigabit technology ports. Um, we have new 3850s. Um, the one at the bottom here is basically 24 ports. So that those ports are um, 100 meg, 1 gig, Two and a half, five, and ten. So it's basically it's a it's a ten G based T switch. This one here is the twenty four port. The forty eight port up here I think is twelve ten gig ports, and the rest is one gig. And we have new line cards for the four K. So we're basically refreshing the access the access switching line. Um, all these things should be on display at World of Solutions. I don't remember exactly where they're shipping, when they're going to ship. If you really want to know that question, send me a note. I'll find a product manager. Um, as I said. We have the 4500, um, new 48-port line card, 12, 12 ports of um, high speed, um, a bunch of ports in the system. Uh, 3850, uh, as I said, 24 and 48 port. The 24 is all 1, 2 and a half, 5 and 10. The 48 port is 12 of them. Um, we also have some uplinks coming up in these guys. So there's some 40 gig uplinks coming. Um, the compact switch, you guys familiar with the compact switch? Okay, so again, it's, it's a small extender. You could either use these, um, you could use these ports either as downlinks to wave to APs, you could potentially use them as uplinks to another copper device. So that's, that's basically the, um, the portfolio. So we're looking to roll it out in the premium side of the access switching. All right. There's probably a question coming, it says, when does it come to a 2K? And the answer is, well, if you look what we do, right, features come in at the high end and they eventually make their way down. Uh, here's a summary, which basically says it's a very good idea. Um, and I think this is actually interesting. Um, we're really looking to see, I, I told the joke earlier, five years ago, right, we would think about selling two ports per person on the campus, right, a PC and a phone. If I, if I truly believe the, everything's going wireless, in five years' time, that'll be one port for 10 people. So to stand still, I have to go and find 19 ports. So, I think there's a whole lot of interesting things for us thinking about what we do for selling other things in the campus. And I think clearly the strategy for us is going to be the IoT story is like plug everything else in. So I think claiming this is next generation workspace, I mean, aside from the fact that we're using next generation, really it's about what's the workspace going to look like in five to 10 years' time. Okay, that is the end of my product management deck. Does anyone want to comment on that before I move on to technology? Let's go to what's been happening. Um, so clearly, the previous deck was the product management deck. This is the engineer deck. Um, so here's the challenge. And so this is part of the material I presented at the CFI. So the CFI in .3 is how you start a project. So this was actually co-led between myself and my colleague from Broadcom. 
for those who are following the politics, you'll know that Broadcom and I were on the other different sides of this argument. But right now, pretty much the switching side of the house, we all agree this has got to get done. We don't know who's going to be the winner yet, but we agree we need to do it soon. So we have very good agreement on the basic goals. Uh, the key thing I'm showing here is, and this is, this link here is basically a reference to the Cisco white paper on uh, 11AC. And they make the point that over time, we've basically had you know, low-end low APs, high-end AP, mid-high-end. The interesting point we're saying here is this is crossing a gig. So the standard numbers that I get to play with and I can't get better is in general, people expect 75% efficiency. So if you have a, uh, a radio rate of two gig, you want 75% of that for the wire. That depends on how efficient your scheduling is on wireless. It depends on where you're doing cap app, all these other things. But that's a nice round number. So when you look at this and you say, OK, up here, right, 2013, 2015, you're above a gig. Now, if you're only 10% above, you wouldn't care. But if you're starting to get you know, two, three times. OK, this is, again, the massive, the massive install base. Same picture again. Um, what's interesting about Cat5e is, according to everything we know, it's still actually growing. It's not growing very much but there's still actually like 20 million ports a year going in. So people are pulling out old cat 5 e and putting in new. Um, between when we first started and now, we're actually seeing Cat6 has been a lot bigger than we expected. And that's sort of interesting to see, but that's still not getting you to 10 gig. All right, so in October, four companies formed the MBST Alliance. That was Cisco, Aquantia, Freescale, and Xilinx. Um, Cisco, we, we are not telling you which, fire, which fires we're using in our, in our uh, devices. But there's only one company that claims to have shipping sil silicon. I'll let you do the math. Um, it's sort of interesting to see exactly why Freescale and Xilinx are interested. I mean, I can think of a few reasons, but if you want more, you'd have to ask them. Um, so the basic goals is we want two and a half and five gig over install based copper cable. Uh, we need a full ecosystem. I'll go on to that in a little bit. We have to do advocacy in the industry. So we thoroughly want to basically deliver the right thing for our customers and take them forward, right? And to do that, we have to create consensus around our solution as being appropriate, timely, and deployable. And so we'll be doing advocacy in standard, in SDO, standard development organization like 802.3. We'll have to work in the Ethernet Alliance. We might get involved in the Wi-Fi Alliance Avenue. There's a bunch of places we might be going talking. Uh, in November 2014, we held the CFI. That's where you start the project. So as I said, I co-led that with a gentleman from Broadcom. Uh, all these things have links, and so I'll link you to the presentations if you want to go and do research. Um, so we went from September to November, and we got unanimous support. Uh, we did get some pushback from one area, which is the cabling industry. For them, this is a bit of a tricky sale. Um, but I think my call, for, my judgment from last meeting is, in a general rule, they're now no longer opposing. Right? And so I think they're seeing that this actually is going to become a good thing for them eventually. But it's a little difficult for them to figure out how to position it to their customers. So my goal with those guys eventually is to get to the stage of I understand what, where I'm going to be and where they're going to be. And I think if you imagine cabling normally being a 10 to 15 year life cycle, I would recommend people, put you know, if they're going to gut the building, put good cable in. Um, so the NBC Alliance, we have a draft 1.0 of our spec. The spec is really covering the line side encoding. We're going to have a bunch more specs that we do, but the key point right now is how do you actually do the, the physical layer encoding on base T? Um, this is not my specialty, so if there's someone in here who's a FI expert, you're going to beat me. Um, as I said, we have a spec. MG base T has a spec. They don't talk to each other. We also, there's no actual way of comparing them right now because they're proprietary within the alliances. So the expectation is as we go forward, we'll start making proposals to dot three, then things will become open. So if you ask me gory details about the spec, I'm going to say I cannot tell you. If you'd like to become a member of the Alliance, then you, then you have access to the spec. Um, for someone just to read the spec, it's 5K. Uh, to help shape, shape the spec, it's 10K a year. To be on the board, it's 20K a year. So they're sort of rough numbers, similar to like a 25 gig Alliance. OK, January 15. So again, remember, we basically we started in October 14. November 15, we basically got authorization to start the, the work. Uh, we had a meeting in Atlanta, not last week, the week before. Uh, we now have all of our formal documents approved to start the standard. We can't actually start yet because we need to wait for the next meeting in March. IEEE works on plenaries every, every four months and interims between. You can only become a real standard at a plenary. But uh, what we came out of last meeting is all, all the documents we need have been approved by the set of group. So we're working on a very, we're going really fast. 
Now this, this bit has been easy because what we've really done is been very focused on what's the use case, what the problem we're trying to solve. We have not yet started discussing the two different ways of solving it. So right now, both myself and my colleagues in the other alliance and also the independent system vendors are all saying, move forward, agree the requirements and move forward. Um, okay, so I'm going to, so, sorry for the eye chart. So currently we have 21 companies. So we formed with four companies in October. Um, this is actually hot off the press. Marvell just joined us a week ago. Um, so we're now at the promoter level, we have Aquantia. Uh, Aquantia are a, still a, start, a private company focused on 10G based T5s. Uh, you have Cisco, Intel, Freescale, Marvell, Qualcomm, and Xilinx. So these are a good set of names. Um, they're serious in the industry, they have volume. Uh, we also have people, if you think about uh, both Freescale and Qualcomm, they have positions in uh, wireless as well. Next level down, there's contributors. These are people who can work on the standard. We have Cavium. There's a consultant here. We get also Micro Semi and Molex. There's a bunch of interesting stuff you have to do to try and make sure this is all nicely deployable, and you have to look at the magnetics and how power runs and everything else. So our goal is to build a full ecosystem of everything you need because companies are reasonably worried about pre-standard deployment. So we want to try and make sure we can roll out the whole thing so you have a package. Um, down in the adopters, these are people who um, basically are off offering support for the, uh, for the work. Uh, there's a couple of small fire companies in here like Tahuti. They'll probably go and build it in their fire. And so down here you actually see a few things. There are a couple of companies, uh, Aruba and Brocade, who are in both alliances. That's fine with me. Um, exactly why they're in both is a question for them. We also have uh, Ruckus down here. Um, so as you can see, we're working very hard to be um, cross-vendor. Um, there are a few vendors who are clearly in the middle, um, HP and Dell spring to mind. Um, I, if I was guessing on their intentions, um, their goal eventually is because everyone wants this to become a standard, right? And so it's going to be interesting over the next six to 12 months how we, how we work this out so it stays productive. Will you expect them to join the alliance at some point? I would love them to join. You know, that was another question. <laughs> um, would you, do you expect them to join, or do you think politics would restrain them for, from doing that? So right now, I'm not sure they would. Um, it would be very nice if they did, but it, might also, it may also be, it may be negative because there's probably a position for the people committed to both sides and the people in the middle arguing for the users. Because once it's at standard, you could change either switches or either access point, no matter what the vendor is, right? Okay, so when we end up with the standard, right, the goal of the standard is, is everyone can build it and it's easy. Okay, getting there is interesting. So right now we have a bunch of people who are committed to, what, to one side, a bunch of people committed to the other, and a bunch of major system vendors who, who are as yet not publicly committed. So I, I have the discussion with HP and with Dell on a regular basis, and I get, I get a very non-committal answer. Um, so what's the alliance doing? Uh, we're working on expanding our specification portfolio. We have line side. We're starting to work on system sides. We're going to work with the power companies, magnetic companies, to talk about how we build this nicely. Uh, we'll try and build a complete ecosystem. There are some people in here that are not in here I would like to have in here, like uh, Fluke and Xeer and Spiron. But those guys are also in a bit of a tricky position because they have customers on both sides of the house. So I am working with them, trying to encourage them, um, and we'll just have to see how that goes. Um, and we'll do advocating, right? Industry forums, SDOs, trade shows, conferences. So we'll be out there talking about how we think what we have is appropriate. Okay, so what's our goals? The basic goal is we want two and a half or five extra bandwidth uh, without new cable. Um, basically, we have Cisco, the embassy alliance. That's the goal. Uh, how are we going to promote the technology? A bit more detail. We're going to go and write a bunch of specs. We'll probably have, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if we did a certification of some, some side. We'll probably do plug fests. We'll do all the normal sorts of things you do with pre standards. Um, what sort of companies do we want? We want switching wireless companies, Cisco and Ruckus. We want silicon providers like Aquantia and Frisco and Xilinx, like component vendors, NIC vendors. So we want everyone to come. Um, some of these people will come, some of them won't. What are we going to do? We're going to go and do more work on our two and a half and five gig physical aspects. Um, the goal again is 
regardless of standardization, we need to make sure we can have multiple people build the things that are interoperable. Right? So the goal is, if you have something which is NBASD compliant, it's going to talk to the guy at the other end. Um, so we have to do interoperability and compliance testing. We have to figure out the fi mac interface. Again, there's a whole bunch of reasons why we need to make it so that everyone can put these things together. Right? So a quantity build fires, um, Marvel build fires, and switch chips. The test build switch chips. And so we've got to make sure we understand how all these things plug together. Uh, there's a bunch of interesting work about magnetics, uh, how to make the RJ45 connector efficient and nice. And so we'll do PR and trade shows and case studies and white papers and FAQs. So Alliance is now almost four months old. The startup is a lot of getting people together. Um, we're really starting to, we're starting to crank up the, uh, the working groups now. Uh, what do we need to do? We need to su um, support initial deployments. So clearly Cisco is going to be out saying, we stand behind it. Right? We have a bunch of other people as well. We need to build interesting consensus and momentum behind InBase-T. Um, you can build this by having um, good contributions to tilt three. You can build, oops, that. You can build this by having uh, external bodies accept it. You can build it by showing you deployments. Eventually, you have to build technical consensus. So the consensus in IEEE tilt three is 75%. The way you get there is by having an appropriate solution that meets the requirements and is deployable. Uh, just another slide basically saying, oh, you know, what's Cisco's part, what's the Embassy Alliance part, what's added to three part. Ultimately, right, for this to be a success, we need one standard from dot three, we need it fairly soon, and we all need to be able to go and build this and move on. Um, timeline, I'm gonna, I've sort of talked through this stuff already. Uh, the next thing is, the red looks really horrible. So we'll have a meeting in, like over Feb, we have a bunch of work to do some more use cases. Um, What's a little bit interesting is that the enterprise noise environment is very different to data center. Uh, if any of you have been involved in 10G based T rollouts in enterprise, it's a little bit interesting. Um, they don't resist noise very well. So we're gonna go and do some work trying to look at what deployments we think really exist and what the noise environment looks like. I mean, are we dominated by cable to cable noise? Are we dominated by external impulse noise? This is gonna be an interesting subject for discussion. When we brought this up in the meeting two weeks ago, um, a bunch of people said finally. So the goal is to go and look at what the noise environment really, really looks like and figure out what we have to solve. Um, we have a meeting in March in Berlin. At this stage, we're gonna to go to the, the big ADA three group and say, can we please start? Um, the rule there is we need 75%, but we actually, you actually need more like 90%. So we'll go through every one of our formal documents and all of our objectives, and they get voted on individually. Once that's done, then we really move into that we can start writing our standard. Um, and we'll meet our first one seriously in about May. So we'll be seeing between, we've started from September to about May, we'll be ready to start looking for seriously at documents. Are, are you exploring running, um, running these speeds over anything other than copper? Um, meaning, you know, can I use this as a switch interconnect um, for, you know, maybe low cost switches where I don't necessarily want to run 10 gig out to a switch, but you know, running, running two 2.5 gig links over some fiber would be great. We're not looking at it currently. It could be done. Um, the real question is, if you think about the interconnect, I'd have to go and check. I suspect you don't see much difference between what will support a one gig fiber and a 10 gig fiber. So the question is, I'm not sure you'd really save a bunch of money. So right now, that's not part of the goal. Right now, the goal is quite explicit about, we're trying to solve the, the problem of the access into the enterprise network, right, which is dominated by base T. Sure, I'm just thinking that there's, there's still a pretty significant delta between one gig optics and 10 gig optics. Um, it could be done. At scale. Um, we are not currently going to start that one. Um, that would potentially be a controversy we'd like to ignore right now. Um, but I would also, if you follow what's happening in 25 gig, they started very focused purely on three meter and five meter twin X. They're now studying uh, relatively short range multi-mode fiber, uh, like 50 to 70 meters. So I think what you find is if there's a real business case for it, it can get done. So yeah, my, my guess would be that's not what most people are gonna worry about right now. If you know, a few years down the line, someone figures out it actually makes sense, then you could do it. Um, for you guys who may not have seen this, um, well, this is not, okay. 
This is actually from uh, the Catalyst 30, 850, 3050 switching architecture. So just as a quick refresher, this is the switch I know and love. Um, if you look inside one of these guys, you'll find uh, some power supplies, um, some ports, some PoE controllers, and you'll basically find uh, a couple ASICs. So it's one of these guys here. That's the ODP ASIC. Um, what you'll actually notice if you look at this switch is basically you have power supply fires, a CPU, and some switches, right? There's nothing around the outside. It's all integrated. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is I'm going to sort of show you what it looks like when we change from the 24-port 1 gig to the 24-port um, multi-gigabit. So this is the basic structure for the 24-port um, 1 gig. There's a CPU here. If you go look at the actual breakout, right, it has more details about the CPU type, and the, but from this point of view, I don't care. So there's a whole CPU block over here. You end up with actually with one chip, which basically talks to the stack interface. And over here, you know, there's octal, uh, octal fires and some uplinks over here. This one is running a UDP ASIC at 375 megahertz, which gives you basically about 56 gig. -y. Actually, in the gigabit per second is a bit misleading. It's actually 50 gig -y in packets per second. It runs faster than that if you're actually doing research. Okay, so if I go across to the multi-gigabit one, this side is basically all the same. What you'll actually find is, we, is we, for a later switch, we cranked up the CPU. We basically just add the CPU footprint as we go in time. So for instance, what we might have paid $50 for a while ago, now would be like 35, so we just pay 50 again. So we just tend to, CPU-wise, we just keep going and stay about the same point on the curve. Now what you're seeing now down here is basically we have a whole bunch of fires, but these are now 10, 10 gig fires. Um, you'll also find that we basically have, instead of one Doppler core, we actually have four Doppler cores. So what we have now is these devices are now running at uh, 500 megahertz, or about 80 gig. And there's effectively four times capacity of the one that used to be there. Um, so I guess the key point I'm trying to make is the structure didn't change. We just threw more chips into it. Um, it's going to be interesting, and I, I truly don't know the answer, what we do for pricing on this one. Um, but I will remind you that when we released the 3850, we actually priced it the same as the 3750. Right? Um, so I think ultimately the success of this, clearly it's going to work, come down to whether we actually succeed in terms of if we can deploy it to most people's organizations and it just works, that's a very good thing. The other question is, is what's the incremental cost? So there's a, a very high component of pricing in how, how successful I think we'll be. Um, a couple of Q&A things. Um, there's a link to the University Alliance. There's a link to the CFI, which I co-led. There's a link to the study group. The study group's working through. It's got a bunch of new stuff. It's doing noise measurement. It's doing... Um, some system requirements, it's doing um, cabling studies. Uh, we have products on the showroom floor. Um, go have a look. So the, but I think all of the 4K, the compact, and the 350 should be out there. Um, I believe that there is an interoperability demo with something else, but I wasn't able to confirm that before I came here. So if you happen to be there, go and have a look and say, does it talk to anything? I'm hoping the answer is yes, but if it's not, don't be too disappointed. Um, there's a bunch of sessions. There's a 3850 and 3650 switching architecture. That's where I stole that deck from. There is a panel on campus switching innovation. There's also a panel which I'm speaking on about uh, introducing the alliance. So that one there has an analyst speaking. I'm speaking. Hassan Siraj, who's the senior director of product management, is speaking. Uh, my colleague from DOT3 and Ethan Alliance and MBC, Dave Chopsky from Intel, is speaking. Um, and one or two customers. Um, there's a, there's a blog, there's a solutions page, and the, I was in a TechWise TV thing a while ago, so that was a lot of fun. And I am done. Um, I have time, so if you'd like questions, I'm happy to answer any of them. And if you want to go home early, that's okay with me as well. If you go back to the slide that has the, the 10 gig files at the bottom where you're breaking those out into, into the, the, there you go, that one right there. Uh, you, you know that that lower red band is really really light on details from an from an yep from a from an. Sorry, yeah. Okay, it says twelve times ten gig. Uh, it's 100, 100 meg, one gig, two and a half gig, five gig, and ten gig. So then it was sort of light on details on how that works out. Is that is, is there like from a technical perspective? How are you how are you breaking that out? If you go back in time, what you'll find is that Cisco has a long history of publicizing specs like SGMIO and QSGMIO, um, and there is a follow-up version of that called USXGMIO, which right now you have to join our alliance to get a copy of. So 
what we normally do with base T things is we run a multiplex, a multiplex link out to a phi. Now, SGMII was basically single one gig link. QSGMII is, is, is four of them running over, I think, four gigabits or five gigabits a second. <coughs> so US XGMI at this stage will be running at 10 gig cities. So what we're basically doing is we're running, it's, it's a link to a phi and it can run multiple speeds. So whereas previously we would have had a one gig phi that could run 100 meg or 10 meg, now we have a 10 gig phi that can run um, five and two and a half and one. It gets a little interesting between, um, between uh, the high speeds and one because the high, uh, one is using 8B, 10B, and the high one's using 64, 66, encoding wise. So the encoding, changed radic the encoding changed radically between 1 gig and 10 gig. So the basic goal of everyone doing this is to take everything we learned about 10 gig, because we've been doing it for a while, and basically make it useful at, lo at um, lower speeds and longer range. And again, the goal of this wasn't to answer all the technical questions, but to give you somewhat of a flavour of what's going on. And from my point of view, if you guys end up leaving with a whole lot of questions, that's good for me because I can do a whole lot of feedback. Off a lot. Do you expect to manifest itself in some sort of a draft version of the specification that people are going to be early to adopt? Like, So anyone who's going to be early to adopt is joining our alliance and has the, draft, has the spec. Um, so I guess I was more concerned about, like in what we see in the wireless space is 802.11n. We see draft 802.11n, draft 802.11n. You know, see the, all these draft versions of, of uh, to be coming spec, right? I heard about that. Um, so... So, so let me tell you what I heard about that, and you can correct me if I got it wrong. I believe what really happened in that case was the group effectively deadlocked and, and it couldn't make a decision. Um, and so, again, what I heard is eventually the Wi-Fi alliance sort of did it for them. Um, I think, and so my, one of my previous experiences in, in 802 was 802.17, resistive packet rings, which is a great technology, but we deadlocked the group, we argued for three and a half years, and we lost the market. So when I was talking to people as we're starting to set this up, because I'm, I, I'm clearly a partisan for one side, and so I was talking to the hierarchy of dot three, trying to explain why, why, why I could do this job effectively. And part of the story was, I've done dot 17, I don't want to do it again. Um, I think there is a strong recognition of the, from the industry and ethernet, and because a lot of us are both parts of the market, we cannot afford to wait four years. So, inside, inside the next not very long, we're gonna to have to get some answers. Yeah, but there's no there's no Wi-Fi Alliance equivalent organization on the wired side. There's there's no wired alliance. Actually, there is. It's called the Ethernet Alliance. Now, depending on who you listen to, the so the Ethernet Alliance to some extent views itself as the marketing arm of Ethernet. So they do, for instance, I'll be doing a webinar with them in the near future, um, with uh, basically talking about this. They had a uh, they had a small conference, the one day conference in. September on the rate debate where they were really talking about 25 gig and, and two and a half and five. So there's a bunch of people who care about it there. So the Ethernet Alliance is really a organization of vendors. And so it's, they do a couple of things. They, they try and market outbound about what's happening in standards. They also try and basically take vendor input and put it back into the standard. So what I would hope to get from the Ethernet Alliance is a very strong message to both, both the vendor alliances and dot three, which is, we need this, we need this fast, it can't be a science project. And everybody who's in the various and sundry IEEE um, uh, uh, groups are also in the Ethernet Alliance as some member, um, so they're- a, a, lot, a, a, lot, a lot of them over, right? So, so the Ethernet Alliance and, and ADSL3 work together very closely. So for instance, the chair of the Ethernet Alliance, who's done John D'Ambrosia from Dell, also runs a couple of the, at least one of the, the groups in uh, IEEE for 400 gig. So equally, I'm, on, on the Ethernet Alliance calls uh, on base T, we have the, uh, the, the 803 working group chair on, on those calls. So he, he's a gentleman by the name of David Law from HP. And so HP, as you saw, are conspicuously absent. They're not in either NBASE-T Alliance or MGBASE-T, but they're very interested in getting this solved. So if you go back and look at the CFI material we put together, um, so we had speakers from Cisco and Aquantia and Broadcom and Marvell and HP. And so starting the project going, we're all agreeing on the problem. So really the question is how we just need to keep that momentum going. And I think part of that is going to be to make sure that once we explain to our customers what we're doing, right, then we get a little bit of um, the light is shone on us, right? If we go off and start arguing for nine months, I think it'll be very clear and I would expect to get 
strong feedback from the user community that we're not doing the right thing. So then the stupid question is, is going, going back to the one I asked at the beginning, is, uh, is okay, so we've got product that's been an announced, probably going FCS here in the next couple of months. Yep. Um, what are the chances that that product will adhere to whatever comes out of whatever working group? For the most, for the most excellent question, take a, take a sample chip. Thank you. Oh, very nice. Oh, no, I'm jealous of you, actually. Nice. Oh, wow. So we've been clearly developing product for a long time. Um, if you had asked me the question a year and a half ago, could you standardize this? I would have said, hell no. No way in the world would Dot3 look at this. Then 25 gig happened. I think 25 gig, if you're following it, is a very interesting case of Ethernet becoming pragmatic. You already have 40 gig, but it actually ends up making a whole, it's a lot better bang for buck to run 25 gig from the server to the data center. You go, cool, got that. So now it's the 25 gig link. If you did that, then your uplink becomes 100 at four, at four by 25. And then you see a nice picture of like a top of rack, top of rack switch in the data center, which is 64 lanes to 25 gig. It's 48 by 25 plus 4 by 100. You go, got that. So that's a very pragmatic choice. They didn't say I want to go 10 times as fast. They said, if I do this, I get better bang for buck. OK. This is a similar sort of decision. So once they got 25 through, it was like, oh, maybe we could. It's trickle down logic. Yeah. We already decided to be pragmatic once. Maybe we could do it again. Um, so for instance, 25 gig started just doing twin X. Also, they've now started 25 GBase T. So 40 GBase T was almost done. They're going to slide 25 GBase T in. All right, so then you go. So what happened for me was I was actually mostly working on 80.1, all this nice TSN stuff for time sensitive. I was in Ottawa for the joint meeting between dot one and dot three when this came up. So at that stage in dot three, no one, no one from my side of campus switching was showing up, right? Because there hasn't been anything very interesting. But this was clearly us, and so I got hauled in. So I'm not really a dot three physical A guy. What I'm really doing is expressing user need and system requirements. So I view I'm basically a consumer of the standard. So I'm going to the, the people who write the five spec and saying I need you to write me a spec so I can build this system to solve this problem. So what's the chances of our Product we ship now becoming standard. Well, if I do my job really well, quite good. If I don't, not so good. Um, I would hope to know within 12 to 18 months. So there's still a there's still a nominal risk in being an early adopter of the multi gigabit products, and I guess that was really yeah, the crux of my question. There is a standardization risk. I mean, I would I would look you in the face and say. One of the things when we actually did the UADP in 3050 was we finally stopped supporting ISL. Do you remember ISL? All right, so yes, we had a pre-standard VLAN, right? We didn't win. We kept supporting it for a long time. So let's imagine- Inline power, power there's a whole bunch of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I don't want that to be the case. That's not good for me, but there's really three choices for standardization. We standardize one, the other, or something in the middle. There's only three choices, right? Or we do nothing, right? I think nothing is clearly bad, and I think the user community will not let us do nothing. Right? If nothing else, Dot 11 will come marching down the corridor and try and strangle us all, right? Because the idea that they can't start pushing 11 AC wave 2 APs without, without 10 GBST will be crazy. So, right now, we're not in task force, we're not making decisions. I think the things which are going to come into evaluation are, let's say we get three proposals. Right, we're going to have to look at how well they meet requirements, how viable are they in terms of cost, how well proven are they. Eventually, everyone, if you look forward five years, we're going to want to be a stage where everyone can build this and simple. So I think there's a pretty strong incentive not to argue for too long. Okay, if you choose something in the middle, then everyone resets. So I would say we've done this before, we know the impact. Um, I have an idea how I want to proceed. Part of what I'm doing and part of the reason I'm here is I think a clear expression from the user community of we want this and we want this soon is going to help. So for instance, one of the things that we had in the meeting in January was um, the system vendors, particularly the ones independent of alliances, basically made a statement that says, we believe that 5 gig over 5 e is very important and you have to address it. 5 gig over 5 e has some interesting technical challenges. So one option would have been to punt. But if we have 38% of the market out there with 5e, from a system vendor point of view, you can't ignore it. We also don't want to do a rocket science project. I mean, you can't go off and spend five years trying to make this better. 
So if I do my job really well, right, and all the skies line up, then my Cisco customers will be very happy. Right? But that means someone else's customers won't. So trade-offs. I have more questions or are we out of time? Okay, uh, are you are you foreseeing a situation where you may have to uh, relegate uh, Cat five e to two point five gig, and require Cat six for five gig, or are you just not even considering it's all or nothing? So there was that suggestion from some elements of the people in the room. So we had about fifty to sixty people in the room um, in Atlanta. Um, Cisco does not believe that is a, a acceptable choice. We would let me okay, let me rephrase very carefully. In 802.3, you all show up as individual voters, voting your individual technical opinion, sponsored by a particular company. The set of people who I happen to work with, and this is not only Cisco, but other people, we actually agree that we really need to address 5E. Um, so, 5E is, with 5G. Sure. Now, the interesting question is under what conditions will it work really well? So clearly, in the worst condition, we have six around one, 100 meters fully bundled, it's gonna be interesting. Uh, it depends whether your Cat 5e is from the best vendor or the crappiest vendor. So we're going to go and do some work to try and study what that really means. So right now we're setting requirements, and we're doing requirements into the standard. So the requirement into the standard will be to address um, two and a half gig over over 5e and anything better. Um, and they use this funny language called up to at least. So they don't just say 100 meters; they say up to at least 100 meters. And you go, what the hell does that mean? It means well, you have to anything between one to 100 is okay. There's a whole lot of language that you need to like a decoder for. Um, so five gig over cat six, up to at least, five gig over five E up to. So it's quite possible we'll find that there's some, there are some worst case conditions where it might not meet 100 meters. This requires a little bit of standards gymnastics because you don't like writing standards like that. I'm inclined to think from a product point of view that's manageable. So the goal is what we want to do is do Understood technology at a reasonable price to get the best performance you can out of the cable that's out there. So we don't want to go off and spend five years inventing new, inventing new modulations to do this. So there is very common sense stuff you do from a product point of view. It's tricky to put in the standard speak. So there is a, there is a very strong motivation to get this done by a whole bunch of people. So I'm optimistic. Right? I cannot tell you that it will be smooth and nice because eventually what you have is you have you know, we have 50, 60 people now. We could have 70 or 80 people in the room. To make progress, you have to get 75% of people agreeing. So, the Wi-Fi Alliance, people like you guys, as I want to keep reinforcing that, actually, if you agree with me, reinforce that this is important, we need to move forward, it doesn't can't take too long, right? And if it's really not important, tell us that as well. Because then I could go off and do something else. Question: um, The Cerdi's architecture. So, are you running uh, two and a half gigabits um, speeds on the serializers and deserializers? Because then it raises a question: If you use like a one gig port, are you using? Are you then wasting resources on a chipset? Or right, how optimized is that? Then technically, does that mean you can get more ten gig ports on an equivalent chipset, and so on and so forth? Um, okay. Let, let, let me try and figure out what I could honest, say to you fairly honestly and safely. Um, it depends. All right. um, so it really depends what generation you're in. Um, so the answer varies between when we originally shipped our first 3050, we were on 65 nanometer. Yeah, we rolled fill out soon after the 45. Now we're looking at things on 28 and 32. And so it really depends on what generation you're at. Um, right now, I think we're, we'd be mostly looking at 10 gig. So if you, if you look at the box, which is, Try and answer it fast. So this box is basically 10G based T box, which can run slower. So from that point of view, it's got the 10 gig series in there already. You ask an interesting question, which is, could you optimize for something else? So uh, Vitess and Aquantia put out a reference board fairly soon after they announced some stuff. I believe the reference board uses 2500 base X, and so it's limited to 2.5 gig. So I think ultimately that's going to be a product choice. Okay, so. And it comes back to the pricing question, right? At what, at what point does this become compelling for someone to take? Because as you pointed out, sir, I forgot your name, um, the man who won a Doppler, um, there is some risk involved to go and pre-standard, right? And so if you imagine people are gonna look at this and they're gonna do an ROI, it's like I have some risk for pre-standard, um, 
but I get this great benefit, I can start rolling out um, 11AC Wave 2 things faster, right? I can feature-proof my network. I do believe there's other uses for this. Um, the reason we're at the Wave 2 APs is it was such a clear and compelling case. If you've got a really simple case to do something, just use that one. Everything else can follow behind. So long term, the question is where do you optimize and when? And at some, at some stage, 10 GB will become cheap. But I would ask you to think about right now, gigabit ethernet is the most successful thing in the world. It's been done from 1999. It's everywhere, right? But when it first came out, it wasn't, right? When it first came out, it was new and interesting and expensive. So as you look over time, ethernet has moved forward. We're just getting, we're making the steps a little bit smaller. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that on the list of people who were included as, uh, as uh, uh, folks that you're trying to garner um, uh, more interest from, uh, NIC manufacturers, in, yeah. including folks like Broadcom and Intel, right? Because uh, there, there's certainly going to be a play at the so desktop. Broadcom is a little bit interesting because Broadcom is the founder of the other alliance. <laughs> okay, on the on the NIC side of the house, I suspect is is probably their focus, right? Uh, Broadcom, Broadcom have the whole infrastructure. Um, Broadcom make everything from fires to switching to everything else. So I mean, I guess I guess what I'm saying is on the on the desktop on on the on the on the desktop adapter side of the house, well, you at least have Intel, right? Um, so um, a gentleman from Intel is speaking with me on the panel. He's also the Ethernet Alliance uh, base T subcommittee chair. He's also the 83.3 chair for 40 GBST, 25 GBST, and now this new program. So um, if you go and look at the panel and look at his history, it says which bit of Intel he works for, but Intel is a very big company. So yes, I have some ideas where I think this could go, but this is, my crystal ball is running out of batteries. Um, also, the other thing that we are a little cautious about is, for instance, at the minute we're, in the pro we're just about to be allowed to prove starting our standard, right? And uh, we would like not to have very confused discussions about where this goes before that, because that just gets very confusing. So we really wanna go into the standards group with we're going to solve at least this very simple problem and anything else ahead and not spend another eight months arguing about everything else. So we want to get going to meet the current need, then I believe you're going to find that it's going to expand out into other use cases. The, the, one, the one I heard a while ago was possibly you could go and build an interesting story around someone doing content editing without looking at um, high bandwidth video streams because they need like three and a half gig. And it's like, that was a gentleman who worked in that business. And I said, excellent, could you please come and give me that requirement so I can make sure I can drive it into my group. So right now, I'm, actually, I'm acting fundamentally as product management into this standard saying, I need you to do these things so I can build a product to solve this problem. 